PC recording is underway. Cloud is up. Good. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place cell phones and electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you have testimony you wish to submit for the record, you may do so via email at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we're ready to begin. Thank you very much and good morning. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams of the 28th District in Queens, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Public Safety. I want to thank the members of the Public Safety Committee who are here. Right now, we have Councilmember Miller, and I'm sure there will be others to follow. Uh, we also have uh, Public Advocate Jamani Williams as well. I want to thank my fellow, my fellow sponsor of these bills, Councilmember Francisco Moya. The hearing we're holding today is of incredible importance as we seek to continue enhancing public safety in our city while curbing incidents of police abuse and misconduct. All New Yorkers deserve to feel safe, supported, and protected, especially by our law enforcement. Over the past two years, the City Council has enacted a series of reforms to address this, some of which include ending qualified immunity against unreasonable searches and seizures, banning the use of choke holes, establishing a right to record police activities, creating an early intervention system, adopting the mayor's police reform plan, which directs critical funding to anti-violence, mental health, and social service initiatives. Today, we seek to build on that legacy by hearing new bills, which aim to bolster accountability, improve safety in NYCHA, and help to prevent bad actors from joining the ranks of our police department. Specifically, if passed, these bills would authorize the Civilian Complaint Review Board to initiate its own complaints, require NYPD to conduct annual security assessments at every NYCHA building, and prohibit persons dismissed for misconduct from other police departments from service with the NYPD. Taken together, this legislation shows our deep commitment to police reform and to improving public safety. With that, I turn it over to committee council for further instruction. I'm here, thank you, Chair Adams. Good morning, everyone. I'm Josh Kingsley, committee council to the Public Safety Committee. Before we begin testimony, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, after which you'll be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen to your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who's the next panel. The first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the Civilian Complaint Review Board, followed by the New York City Police Department. From CCRB, we'll be hearing testimony from Chair Fred Davey, as well as Jonathan Darsh, who's the Executive Director. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to raise any, as, if council members would like to ask any questions of the administration or specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to the testimony at council.nyc.gov. I will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Members of the administration, I will call on each of your names individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. We will begin with CCRB. And then after CCRB provides testimony, I will swear on the folks from NYPD. So from CCRB, Chair Davies, do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And Executive Director Darsh, do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth before those committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you both. You may go ahead. Thank you, Chair Adams, members of the Public Safety Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am Reverend Frederick Davey, Chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, CCRB. I'm here to testify today in support of introduction 2440 that would authorize the CCRB to investigate, hear, make findings and recommend action upon complaints initiated by the CCRB alleging police officer misconduct falling within CCRB's jurisdiction. The bill is critical for the people of, of New York, 
particularly those who are most vulnerable, as it shifts the burden of responsibility away from victims and civilians most in need. As it stands now, even if the CCRB is aware of misconduct, we must receive a complaint from the victim, a witness, or other concerned citizen before we are able to investigate the complaint. This places the burden on New Yorkers to report misconduct, even when situations where they might not feel comfortable, even in situations where they might not feel comfortable, and assumes that everyone has access to the resources to and the knowledge of how to file a complaint. Furthermore, it can lead to long delays before the CCRB is able to initiate, to able to investigate the incident, which can lead to longer investigations and the inability to collect evidence in a timely manner. If the CCRB is aware of misconduct, an investigation should not be delayed or, even, or, or not even occur just because a complaint is not filed. All misconduct must be addressed and be addressed promptly. This bill would bring us one step closer. So in sum, this bill, amending the charter to allow the CCRB to self-initiate complaints, means that the CCRB can proactively open investigations without placing the burden on those most vulnerable to file a complaint themselves. And this bill has the CCRB's full support. Finally, I cannot leave today without mentioning another large impediment to CCRB's investigations, which is that CCRB does not have access to seal records. Currently, the statutes that are enacted to seal records that are often sealed due to police misconduct are used to present, prevent the CCRB from investigating the underlying misconduct that caused the record to be sealed. It is imperative that the CCRB have access to these and all documents that enable us to investigate police misconduct, particularly as the agency embarks on investigating allegations of racial profiling and bias-based policing. We believe that as an independent oversight agency created to investigate police misconduct, we must obtain records essential to our mission. We continue to work with our state partners to achieve the enactment of an exemption from otherwise applicable ceiling statutes by the state legislature. The CCRB has made great strides in the last couple of years and continues to push forward changes and policies that make the agency more effective and police accountability fairer and swifter. I believe this bill will help us to continue the push forward as will striving for the CCRB and all oversight agencies to be exempt from ceiling statutes. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Davies. Um, I actually made a mistake. We were gonna go first to uh, Public Advocate Williams for a statement on the bills. I apologize to Public Advocate for that. So. Um, public advocate, you could go ahead and, and make a statement, and then, and, and Mr. Davies, we will then turn to questioning after that. Thanks for bearing with us. Uh, no problem. Uh, thank you, Committee Council. Thank you, uh, Chair Davey. Uh, thank you uh, to the Chair and uh, to the Public Safety Committee. As was mentioned, my name is Jermani Williams, Public Advocate for the City of New York. Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to testify. <clears throat> I'm proud to be the co prior sponsor of Councilmember Moyer's Bill, Intro 2297 which would prevent the New York City, Department, uh, City Police Department from hiring applicants who have been dismissed from another police force due to misconduct or resigned while being investigated pursuant to a charge of misconduct. I strongly encourage my colleagues to pass the critical piece of legislation. As the law currently stands, someone like Timothy Lohman, who shot and killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice as a member of the Cleveland Police Department, would be eligible for a position with the NYPD. This policy presents a serious threat to public safety in New York City. A comprehensive 2020 study in the Yale Law Journal find that the wandering off that wandering officers, those who have been dismissed from one police department and then hired by a new one, are significantly more likely than other officers to be fired at, at their next job for misconduct. Given the immense responsibility of a police officer, including the discretion to use lethal force, city government has a duty to its constituents to guarantee the applicants that meet the description in question will not be considered for hiring. This bill is also important to the integrity of the NYPD. Over the past few years, the relationship between the NYPD and the communities they serve has frayed in large part due to issues surrounding mis police misconduct. By making it clear that the NYPD will not be a landing spot for those who are found not to be fit to serve in other jurisdictions, the passage of this legislation will be an important step towards reestablishing trust with New Yorkers. 
I'm also supportive of Resolution 1782 by Chair Adams, which calls on the passage of Assembly Bill 7284 uh, and Senate Bill 6489 by Ramos and Benjamin. These bills provide a statewide equivalent to the council's intro 2297. And if passed in conjunction with the city legislation, they will ensure that wandering officers will not be able to serve in any police uh, force in the state. I want to additionally express support for Chad Adams bill intro 2440, which would authorize the civilian complaint review board to initiate complaints. Currently, the victim of police misconduct does not have the capacity to file a complaint. The incident in question will go uninvestigated by the board. This bill's passage would ensure the bureaucratic bar barriers won't impede critical work by the board. I must also raise that in order for the CCRB to serve as a genuine force for accountability, its disciplinary recommendations should be binding rather than subject to overruling or downgrading by the NYPD. As this legislation seems com comes, as this legislative session comes to a close, I hope this body will use its remaining time to establish key police reforms, such as the ones referenced above. In partnership with other legislation that addresses the scope of police and accountability measures are critical to the mission of redefining and furthering public safety in our city's next chapter. Lastly, while I have the opportunity to address senior representatives from the NYPD, I'd like to raise the department's recent purchase of guns that require only five pounds of pressure to fire rather than the previously standard 12 pounds. On November 1st, 2021, Councilmember Lander and I sent a letter to the department that asked questions regarding the cost, funding stream, and decision-making associated with this purchase. We've yet to receive a response. Maybe we can get some here today, uh, Madam Chair. As we understand it, this decision was made without any input from any office. Further, our offices are not aware of any complaints that weapons currently used by NYPD officers are or have been insufficient. We are aware that there are too many instances when NYPD officers have resorted to lethal force and led to innocent, uh, innocent people losing their lives. Guns that fire more quickly would not have prevented death or increased the safety of either officers or communities. We have yet to receive responses as I mentioned and thus request the department to discuss the issue in today's hearing. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Um, before we go on, any council members, if you have questions for CCRB, please use the Zoom raise hand function. After CCRB testifies, we'll then turn to police department and you can ask questions to those individuals as well. Um, before we turn to Chair Adams for questions, I wanna recognize uh, council members, Brandon, Cabrera, Holden, Riley, Rosenthal, and Menchaca. Um, Chair Adams, you may uh, proceed with questions for the CCRB, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And I wanna thank uh, Public Advocate Williams um, for always um, being present um, and accounted for in these hearings um, to support his legislation. And we thank him for that. And I will definitely, uh, I'm mindful of that questioning. So thank you very much, Public Advocate, for being here today. Reverend Davey, always a pleasure to see you. Uh, thank you for being here today and thank you in advance for your testimony. If you could just uh, give us um, the current process for initiating a complaint with CCRB, what does that look like? Sure, thank you, Chair Adams and, I would, and, and other council members who are here as well. I also wanna acknowledge uh, our executive director, Jonathan Darsh, who is here uh, and who can provide some texture in some of these, situ some of these uh, questions that, that I might not be able to uh, completely provide. Um, so the, the process is that we, the CCRB gets a complaint uh, from any number of ways, either uh, by telephone, by um, over, the, uh, over the internet, by email, um, a complaint filed at a uh, police precinct, a complaint filed um, uh, with IAB that is under CCRB's jurisdiction that will come, uh, that will come our way. And then it's up to staff to take that complaint to, uh, to verify that we have the jurisdiction uh, and then proceed to, uh, proceed to um, investigate the complaint. Do, John, do you, do, do you wanna add anything to that? Sorry, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. The only thing I would add is the, you could call 311 to file a complaint, but you could also uh, call our hotline at 1-800-341 Two two seven two. You can also go to our website, uh, which is the easiestly found by uh, googling CCRB space NYC, uh, and then filing a complaint with us online. Okay, thank you. Does CCRB believe that there are circumstances where officer misconduct 
may go unreported because an individual chooses not to initiate a complaint with the CCRB? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and usually, as I, as I said in my testimony, people are, are vulnerable. Uh, they, are, they are victims uh, and they um, often uh, don't know how to file a complaint, don't have the resources to follow, file a complaint, um, sometimes don't even know they can file a complaint. And this bill uh, would help to address that. Um, Madam Chair, we live in an age where uh, technology has changed rapidly. Uh, it, we have the ability to see uh, events unfold in real time like we've never had before. And for um, a simple uh, decision that was made uh, about how complaints get filed prior to this um, advancement we have in technology to stand in the way of our stepping into the you know, first quarter of the 21st century uh, would be a huge mistake and a disservice to the people of the city of New York. So we uh, strongly support this bill and believe uh, being able to self-initiate complaints will allow us to further serve uh, New Yorkers. Thank you, Chair Davey. So Chair, Chair Davey, um, we're hoping that this legislation goes through. We're CCRB to be granted authority to initiate an investigation without having received a complaint from a member of the public, how would CCRB then implement such changes in process? Sure, I, I'll start and then I'll turn to John. I think we would pretty much follow the process we have followed to date. The only difference is CCRB would, um, would initiate the complaint and then we would proceed with uh, thorough and partial um, investigations that we would do if we got a complaint from, a, from the victim or a witness or, or, or another source. But I'll turn to John to see if he has any texture, if that's fine, if that's okay, to see if he has any texture to add to this. So I think the first thing the agency would do upon the enactment of this legislation would be to go through a rulemaking process to lay out exactly how uh, the agency would utilize the enhanced powers that the the change would give it, but we think it would enable us to uh, to respond to activity that we see on social media before we receive a complaint so that we can act to preserve evidence. Uh, and, and last year, there were 407 complaints that were withdrawn uh, by a complainant. And so far this year to date, we've had 320 complaints uh, where a complainant withdrew their complaint, where we would be able to continue to find, continue the investigation uh, and perhaps make decisions on the merits of those investigations. That's not saying that misconduct necessarily occurred in those cases, but right now we don't know. So being able to continue our investigations and move forward and reach a determination on the facts would be helpful uh, to the people of the city. Thank you. So what sources of information would be available to the CCRB to inform investigations of police misconduct? So, Madam Chair, I think, as we've mentioned, um, there's ample, uh, ample video on social media uh, that, um, that we all witness and see. Sometimes it's uh, sent to us uh, either directly, uh, sent to me, um, uh, Executive Director Josh and, uh, Dosh and others directly, or it's a direct message uh, to us on social media accounts, um, or uh, people make us aware of uh, video. There's body-worn camera uh, video as well, where um, misconduct is observed, uh, and uh, CCRB could initiate a complaint from there as well. So. Uh, video is the, is the, since it's prevalent and everywhere in society and culture, is the primary source of additional uh, information evidence about alleged police misconduct. But again, I'll see if uh, Executive Director Darsh wants to add anything to that. I have nothing further to add. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues in a minute. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Gibson. So how many additional CCRB investigations would occur each year, would you, would you think? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Johnny, you wanna try? We try estimate that? approximately 500. Okay. 
that's a that's a substantial amount. Okay, I'm going to uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, council, do any council members have questions for CCRB representation? Uh, council members, please use the Zoom Rames hand function if you have any questions for CCRB. Um, I'll give you a minute, and if not, we'll move on to the NYPD for their segment. Seeing no hands raised. Oh, Councilmember Rosenthal. Councilmember Rosenthal, sorry to miss you there. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Adams, for holding this hearing, um, as always. And um, thank you, Chair Davey, for being here. And I appreciate the work you've done. You and I have talked recently about um, to what extent um, CCRB could also be looking at um, sort of disrespectful behavior on the part of, um, uh, sorry, I'm distracted by another panelist, um, but if someone could, sorry, um, we've talked about whether or not CCRB could uh, look at the behavior of other uh, detectives even who are disrespectful to people who come forward. And I really appreciate we were specifically looking at the sex crimes unit. Um, you know, I, and I was appreciative of your follow up and your possible interest in um, pursuing these types of cases. And I was just wondering if um, you could talk on the record about that at all, um, or if this is more something we need to explore, that's fine too. Or if um, Mr. Darsh could talk about it, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Sure, thank you, council member. Let me, I'll just make one statement and then I'll turn it to John if that's appropriate. Um, if a person in the course of an investigation believes they have been disrespected by a member of service of the NYPD, they can file a complaint with the CCRB. And I'll turn it to John for further comment, if any. No comment. It's exactly 100% accurate. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Appreciate your interest. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, committee council and sergeants, for your help with that. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, if any other council members have questions for CCRB, please speak up. Um, I'd also like to recognize Chair Powers. Um, Chair Adams, do you have a question before we move on to NYPD? Or I do have one additional question. Um, how will the CCRB balance when a complainant wants to withdraw? If a complainant wants to withdraw, what would that look like? So let, uh, again, I'll make a comment and then I'll see if John wants to um, uh, speak as well. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm also distracted by the, this uh, other panelist. Uh, but um, if a complainant withdraws from the complaint, um, CCRB still has the opportunity to determine particularly if CCRB can initiate a complaint based on evidence it's seen to determine the outcome of a, of a case of alleged misconduct on the merits. That is, we can investigate and determine whether to it's, uh, it, the, the action actually happened and if it did happen, whether or not it was um, in violation or not of the, um, of the uh, police guide, uh, patrol guide, and other rules and regulations. But John, do you want to add to that? The chair is, is correct. We will have to balance the look at the evidence that we do have once the complainant has withdrawn their uh, complaint and see if we have enough to move forward. And if we can move forward, then, then we will. And if not, uh, the case will be uh, closed without a full investigation the way it currently would be. Thank you very much. Just want to double check again, um, committee council, if my colleagues have no further questions. 
Yep, we have no additional folks here, so we could move on to the next panel. Okay, thank you both for being here to testify this morning. Thank uh, you. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll now move on to the next panelist for the uh, administration, which will be representatives from the NYPD. Um, the same kind of goes as before. If any council members have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, we will let the panel kind of ask questions, or I'll, I'll swear the panel in at this moment. Hold on a second. So for NYPD, we're going to have Deputy Inspector Chief Edward Winsky, who's the Commanding Officer of the Candidate Assessment Division, Deputy Inspector Howard Gottman, who's the Housing Bureau Chief, and then also Michael Clark, who's the Director of the Legislative Affairs Unit. As I mentioned previously, we're going to now swear the members of the administration in. So before I begin, can you please raise your hand, and I will ask each of you individually for a response. Um, Chief Winsky, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Deputy Inspector Gottesman? I do. And Director Clark? I do. You all may begin. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Adams and members of the council. I am Michael Clark. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs for the New York City Police Department. I'm joined today by Deputy Chief Edward Winsky. Commanding Officer of the Candidate Assessment Division and Deputy Inspector Howard Gottesman from the NYPD's Housing Bureau. On behalf of Commissioner Dermot Shea, I wish to thank the Council for the opportunity to discuss the bills being heard today. Uh, intro 2297 would disqualify any individual from appointment to the NYPD who was dismissed from any police force due to misconduct or who resigned while being investigated pursuant to a charge of misconduct. The Department agrees with this employment policy and it has been our longtime practice to not hire individuals who have been dismissed from other department, police departments for misconduct. Accordingly, if the NYPD learns during this comprehensive background investigation that an applicant was previously dismissed for misconduct, that will, applicant will be disqualified from appointment. As such, we support the intent of this bill for it reflects our scrutinizing approach to background investigations. However, we are exploring whether this proposal is consistent with the state civil service law and look forward to discussing this with the council. I note that the state has taken steps to ensure that officers fired from misconduct are not able to join other police departments in the state. In the most recent state budget, the legislature enacted New York State Professional Policing Act of 20, 2021, which among other things, amended the state executive law to require the state's municipal police training council to promulgate rules concerning background investigations for police officers. Additionally, the state budget made it applicable to the NYPD the requirement that all police officers in the state obtain a certificate of satisfactory completion of a basic training program. It also provides that this certificate may be permanently invalidated upon an officer removal for cause, resulting in an officer being ineligible for any future certification in the state. Intro 883 requires the department to conduct an annual, secu annual security assessments for each building in a public housing development in the New York City Housing Authority, or NYCHA. This, this legislation would also require the department to report quarterly on the annual security assessments completed in the prior quarter. The department supports the intent of this legislation, or however, we have operational concerns. NYCHA is the nation's largest public housing authority with 2,302 buildings, including 2,198 residential buildings stretching across the five boroughs. These, these developments range from single units to 25-story buildings. Further, NYCHA buildings include commercial businesses, daycares, community centers, which the NYPD does not have access to. We could not roll out an undertaking of this size we could not roll an undertaking of this size into the duties of the current officers, and it would require the creation of a new unit with the sole purpose of conducting these housing assessments. As an example of the challenges, we would need to do exterior lighting inspections in the evenings to ensure that they work and cover enough area, but also have to work with building managers during the day to ensure com cameras are operating properly. The department is committed to ensuring safety of every New Yorker and takes its commitment to safety in NYCHA very seriously. The NYPD is committed partners with NYCHA and are in constant communication regarding safety measures within, within housing developments. Officers currently have the ability to report security issues to NYCHA through the creation of field reports. To be clear, these are not full security evaluations, but they do document what officers observe while performing their day-to-day -day duties. Additionally, the department works with NYCHA on safety inspections on an ad hoc base, basis based on conditions that are present in a building. In conclusion, the department and the administration support the intent of these bills. And we look forward to continuing dialogue with the council. Thank you. And we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, 
We will turn to Chair Adams for questions. If any council members have any, uh, I see Council Member Miller will follow Council Member Adams. So Council Member Miller, you'll go after Council Member Adams. Chair Adams, go ahead for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, good to see you all this morning. Um, Director Clark, thank you for being here. Uh, before I go to my questionings on the bills, I, I'd just like to address the public advocates concerns. Uh, if any of you are able to answer the concerns about the purchase of the new guns, uh, why that happened, and when will he receive uh, the response that he is looking for? Sure, I, 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 I'm familiar with the, the public advocates letter. Um, my understanding that it is a response has been drafted and should either already made it to the police commissioner's desk uh, for signature or should be shortly. Um, you know, I think it's the goal is to get it out quickly. Uh, in terms of the substance of it, you know, I, I don't think any of us here are the experts on that decision. Um, so I'm a little hesitant to start talking out of turn about that, but I, I should, but I do know that the response has been worked on and uh, should be sub, uh, submitted for PC approval shortly. Or already, already has, I, as of last week, it, it hadn't, but I just, it, as of late last week, but I, I'm not sure exactly where it is there, but I, I'll find out after this. Okay, we appreciate that. And I'm sure that uh, Public Advocate Williams will also uh, follow up once again if that is not received expeditiously. So thank you very much. Thank you, Public Advocate. Uh, okay, so um, Director Clark, what specific circumstances currently disqualify an individual from being appointed as a police officer? Good morning, I'm uh, Deputy Chief Edward Winsky. I'm the commanding officer of the County Assessment Division. Good morning. Good morning. I, I am um, the commanding officer of uh, pre-employment screening for the department for titles, including police officer. And currently, there are four components that would disqualify someone. We, we conduct medical testing, psychological testing, a physical testing, which is called, called a job standard test, and we do a background investigation, we would call a character investigation. Any one of those four components, uh, failure of any one of those four components could disqualify a candidate. So that's that's interesting, um, Chief Winsky. Just uh, I'm thinking character um, character assessment. That's pretty interesting. What what types of um, uh, resources do you use to uh, you know to decide someone's character? Types of resources. I the background investigation includes school history, work history, criminal history, driving history, um, alcohol and drug history. So it, it, it's it's many different um, criteria. Right, and I think a candidate would have to list is required to list all their employment going back to, I think age sixteen, and provide transcripts and provide school records. Um, and our investigators will go through and interview old bosses. Will determine why, if you were fired, why were you fired? Um, if you were, have disciplinary records at your university, what they are, right? Like, and not everything would be a disqualifier. So if you got caught smoking marijuana in your school and had a disciplinary record, you know, I don't think that would disqualify you. But if you got caught stealing, stalking someone, plagiary, right? That might be something we would consider um, in order to determine whether you're a good fit for the NYPD. Right. That's all correct. Yes. Okay. So what entity um, actually establishes those qualification standards? So I think there's standards that are set by the state. Um, you know, it's a combination of state law, uh, the civil service law, uh, the public officers law, the executive law, and then the municipal, municipal training council, which is created in the executive law has rules as well um, that govern um, some of our hiring standards, but these are sort of the minimum standards. They're not necessarily the maximum standards. So we could, you know, use them as guidelines, as minimum floors, um, and but but do more. So, for instance, under state law, you have to be 20 years old in order to be a police officer, right? That's not something we could we could change. And you have to take your test the day before your 34th birthday in order to become a police officer. Right, so those are things that are mandated by state law. You have to be a United States citizen. Again, it's mandated by state law. Uh, but within that, we can sort of raise standards, but not lower. Okay, 
regulated by state law. To what extent is the NYPD actually involved in determining uh, the qualification standards, if any? So we do have a seat on the Municipal Training Council. Um, we are, uh, you know, I, I believe Chief Kenneth Corey or whoever the Chief of Training is, is sort of our representative on that on that board. Um, so in terms of state rules, you know, I think we have a say in that way. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what we have voluntarily done. So we've, we've been part of past studies on uh, hiring practices and, and we follow best practices um, that, are, that are used around the country. We follow department policy and we, and we follow past civil service commission decisions which guide our practices. Right, so if, if we disqualify someone there, there's a process to appeal that. Uh, it goes to the state civil service commission and the decisions of the state civil service commission sort of give us you know, guidance that what, you know, we've disqualified you for X, Y, Z reason. That's, they've given us the blessing so that can sort of be something we go forward with. Um, so that's sort of all this kind of comes into the stew of making, of making our, our hiring decisions. Okay, thank you for that. I see we've been joined by Councilmember Rodriguez as well. Are there circumstances, are there any circumstances at all where the NYPD believes an individual should qualify for appointment as a police officer, even if the individual had previously been fired for misconduct by a police department in another jurisdiction? I don't, I don't think so. I don't see that situation where we would do that. Um, I think you know, what we don't want is hiring people who have been problems elsewhere. And I, you know, I know, I think you and the public advocate talked about the wandering police officers. And certainly that is something in the profession, you know, nationwide has been a concern. But, uh, you know, I think as Chief Winsky said, and we said, it's not something we do and we don't think should happen. Okay, thank you. I, I was going to ask another question. It's similar. Uh, but I'll, I'll twist it a little bit. Are there any known instances of current or former NYPD officers having been appointed as a police officer after having been fired for misconduct by a police department in another jurisdiction? No. Um, so I've been in this position for three and a half years, and there are none in, in those three and a half years. And I sat down with our resident historian who's been in this division conducting this type of work for over 28 years. And, and not that we know of, not that we've documented anywhere, the answer is no. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. I guess um, this is gonna be for DI Gottesman. We're gonna go into your wheelhouse in housing. Um, to what extent is there coordination between the NYPD and NYCHA regarding public safety issues within public housing developments currently? Good morning, Chair Adams. Good morning, members of the council. Um, there isn't a, a work day that goes by without some sort of coordination between uh, the executives assigned uh, in the chief of housing and the executives over at the New York City uh, Housing Authority uh, as well. Uh, in our local PSAs and housing boroughs, there is equal coordination uh, between uh, those local on the ground uh, officers, the NCOs in particular, and the property managers um, in that PSA or that precinct. Are there regular meetings between um, NYPD and NYCHA officials? Yes. How do precincts maintain collaborative relationships with property managers, tenant associations, and residents of NYCHA buildings located within their precinct? Uh, so the, the answer is the meetings that you alluded to in your prior question. Um, the build block meetings, the community council meetings, um, there are impromptu meetings that are called when there's a condition that pops up, um, and um, those are the uh, on the ground, you know, in, entrenched meetings where the actual work is happening. There are other meetings happening at the executive um, headquarters level, um, but uh, that doesn't cover uh, the, the question that you asked. I, I, I'm going to reference um, for me in my district, South Jamaica houses, where the NCOs prior to COVID were very, very much in place, very engaged, um, and, and then the pandemic hit. So for about a year and a half or so, and I don't think stability's come back, um, 
in, in that particular precinct that handles South Jamaica houses, we noticed a drop off in NCOs uh, in their work uh, around the development and um, a whole lot of complaints from residents because there's been no further uh, or in-depth monitoring um, since COVID. So I, I, I'd just like to hear from you whether you hear those complaints or whether you've heard those complaints across other precincts and how do you see that improving over, you know, how do you see that improving in the future? And so to answer your first question first, um, I personally have not heard um, a similar complaint, although I do understand why it appears that there's less contact, obviously with um, COVID, uh, we had a shutdown of the in-person meetings um, for well over a year. Um, we're starting to bring those back. Uh, there are virtual meetings that we have. Obviously, our NCOs uh, are working every day. The PSA uh, you speak of uh, has 20 NCOs and two NCO sergeants. Uh, that particular development has two NCOs. It's a rather large development for that PSA. Um, so I have not personally heard that there is um, a drop off uh, in that contact. Uh, however, perception is what it is. And um, you know, an effort will be made to make sure that that perception um, is not uh, actually happening. Um, this is the first I'm hearing that it mm. seems that the NCOs are less engaged um, since COVID. Um, I will take that back. Uh, to my chief, we'll speak to the PSA and find out um, their uh, attendance. Uh, we'll take a look at how many people are coming pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, and um, make sure that that's not actually, um, you know, the, the perception is not actually uh, a reality. I thank you for that. Um, Pre-COVID, um, our NCOs were extremely attentive and engaged know the residents very, very well. And it was very obvious to me you know, going through um, the developments, uh, you know, over the months, the presence is missed, uh, has been missed. And there are just, you know, there were some things that have been um, out of the norm because of the reduction in attention over the months. So uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm able to put that on your radar. So currently, NYPD responsibilities for providing security and public housing developments derived from an MOU between the NYPD and NYCHA. Has the agreement been modified in years since it was agreed to in the late 1990s? Uh, I'm unaware of any significant modifications in writing to that uh, MOU that was signed in 1994. Um, the, um, the liability or the, the, the use of the NYPD in, in public housing is, goes beyond the MOU. The MOU uh, is a document that created or helped facilitate the merger back in the um, mid 90s. Uh, it, it very much still exists, um, but it, it's our responsibility, policing public housing goes way past the MOU. Okay, so, so uh, D.I. Gottesman, what obligations um, does the NYPD assume pursuant, pursuant to the MOU? Well, the MOU is very, very robust. I'm sure you have a copy, um, but we're responsible for all police services uh, in public housing um, throughout the city, uh, regardless of whether there's a PSA or a precinct that responds. Um, we're responsible to make sure that conditions that detract from the quality of life for the residents the visitors, for the housing authority staff, to make sure those conditions are addressed, um, uh, eliminated if possible, um, at, at the very worst, kept to a, a very minimum. Um, and uh, like you mentioned, the MOU, the MOU is, is, is a very lengthy document um, that goes on for many, many pages um, that creates additional responsibilities that I believe the intention was to make sure that the NYCHA police department and their duties and responsibilities don't fall uh, away from the NYPD when the merger was to happen, which by now uh, is about 26 years old. Okay. 
How often does the NYPD conduct security assessments of NYCHA buildings? Uh, currently, we um, do field reports when we do our interior patrols. Um, there are uh, other occasions uh, beyond the interior patrols uh, where we're either asked by NYCHA to come out and um, do some sort of walkthrough, uh, whether they're putting in um, new cameras or they just have a condition that they want uh, mitigated. Uh, so they will ask us on a one-by-one um, um, -one basis to come out and take a look. But the bulk of our security assessments will be done by officers going into the buildings on calls for service or just doing an interior patrol, either because they are directed to or they self-direct. They just go in because there's a condition that they want to take a look at, and then they will document their findings in what we call the field report. Yeah, that but, but was actually... I'm sorry, that was actually my question, whether or not these um, patrols were scheduled or whether they did them on call by residents or others. Um, so there is no set schedule. Correct. Okay. Uh, what specific things typically uh, is NYPD looking for um, when making these, um, these patrols? We are looking for uh, conditions that would either lower the quality of life uh, in that building or create a um, situation that would endanger the um, residents or the staff of uh, the housing authority. For example, um, a uh, door, the front door of the building or even the rear door of the building. If it's left open, that's a condition, that's a problem, we don't want that. So we'll simply just close the door and correct the condition. Um, however, sometimes, the doors are physically closed, they're just not locked because the lock will be um, not working, it will be broken, vandalized, tampered with, um, in which case that, that goes beyond the scope of our ability. We can't, um, uh, we don't have the tools or the ability to fix uh, a complicated situation like that. So then we'll go to the field report and um, uh, make NYCHA aware of the, the situation for further correction. Thank you. Um, do you share, does NYPD share security assessment findings, all findings with NYCHA? The field reports, yes. The, the field reports are uh, forwarded um, to property managers and borough offices. And, 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 and my, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. And usually when we're doing, you know, Inspector Goddess mentioned when we do sort of the ad hoc uh, review, you know, we're doing it with NYCHA staff. So we're going around with them and telling them what, what we're seeing, right? So it's not, you know, a formal report in the way I think the legislation is envisioning. It's more of a, we go out with the building manager and say, here's where we think you can improve or, 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 in, or get better. Or, you know, I think, you know, Chief Barrera himself has gone out and done some of them. Um, so it's, you know, less of a formal thing like that, more of a, you know, we here, 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 and their staff, you know, can address situations. Okay, thank you. Um, my final question before I go to, I believe, Councilmember Miller. Separate from law enforcement measures, what do you think the city could be doing to make NYCHA buildings safer? It's a really good question. Um, any sort of investment in, um, in cameras, in um, site security, lighting, which they're all doing right now, the upgrades uh, with the LED lights. Um, the upgrading of uh, cameras to more advanced cameras. Some of these systems are quite old. Um, that we're all headed in the right direction. Any any sort of um, uh, funding because it could be quite expensive when you look at the, the price of some of these um, items. Uh, and anything they could um, uh, do to add to that would be an improvement. Okay, it's exactly where our funding goes in the council. We'll continue to to do our part. Uh, thank you very much. We'll move on to council questions. Thank you, Chair Adams. Um, Councilmember Miller, are you uh, able to log on to speak? I hear. I see. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair Adams, and good morning to all. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but I, I'll begin with where Chair Adams left off with her her, her nature questions. A few about uh, agency coordinations and it was uh, admin testified that they uh, uh, do uh, some of these um, 
some of the, the, the surveillance and investigation and the other uh, 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 activities uh, alongside of NYCHA uh, uh, management, uh, are there other agencies involved in such? Um, and as you said, it's not necessarily what the, what the legislation would envision, um, but I think that there is a specific innate uh, uh, ask within the, the legislation, and that's why it's, it's written that way. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in Colin Life, one of the two senior developments that, that are represented uh, in, in District 27, um, there are about two, three blocks from each other, but also worlds apart. Colin Life um, has had a serious security issue uh, for the past eight years, as long as I've been in the council. Five years ago, we invested uh, in capital uh, in a new door uh, in a new uh, cameras and security system, and, and they're not up yet. In the interim, uh, just over the past few months, we've had uh, three overdoses uh, from folks right there on the staircase and in the building uh, who aren't residents of the building. Um, this is constant, has been a constant concern of the, uh, of the residents of Colin Life uh, and my office. Uh, Chief Barrera, while he was once the commanding officer of Queen South, uh, and 103 was very much aware of it. And, and, you know, unless it's bumped up to that level, we don't see the day-to-day -day operations that would coordinate in a way um, that would mitigate this uh, uh, unless we have a crisis and, and, and do that. And, and the reason why I say that is, is because they're constantly concerning about the outside folks that are sleeping in, in the staircase, some folks that have outright taken over apartments of senior residents that live in the building, uh, selling drugs and other nefarious activities. And, and like we have gotten no um, support on this over the years. It's, it's just gotten worse. Um, and the $400,000 investment that we made, uh, we would love for the police department to say that, hey, this would assist them if we can have uh, the new intercom, the, 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 the new security door, and the cameras up and running uh, would support their efforts. But um, in terms of agency coordination, I'd love to you to, to be able to speak to that further uh, around NYCHA. And then the other thing is, um, the administration's dealing of, 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 of drug use, uh, homelessness, and others, it appears that the responsibilities of to remove uh, these uh, folks that are, that are sleeping in stairwells and taking over apartments um, has been removed from the responsibilities of the police department. If that is the case, how do you coordinate with other agencies to keep these seniors safe? Thanks. Uh, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll take your last question first. Um, you are correct, sir. Uh, there has been a, uh, a, an agreement with uh, the Housing Authority, as well as the Department of uh, Homeless Services, uh, DHS, to address uh, homelessness in particular in NYCHA. Um, you are correct in that where there is not uh, deemed to be a safety hazard. Uh, it is the Department of Homeless Services that uh, takes the lead. Uh, when, when we are requested to co-respond with them, if they feel unsafe for whatever reason, uh, they coordinate that um, with us, they notify us, and we meet them at the location, usually with a representative of the housing authority. And um, we then go and engage um, the apparently homeless uh, individual or individuals in the staircases and offer them uh, an array of services. Um, uh, you know that is the um, uh, that is the current uh, method that we uh, use to engage uh, people who are apparently homeless. Uh, it kind of ties in with your first question, which you mentioned the uh, the, the folks found um, uh, in the staircases uh, either um, utilizing uh, narcotics or, or overdose. Um, the the financial um, uh, contributions, whether it was from your office or from uh, others in the city council, um, that does go to the housing authority. 
we do partner with them. Again, if they ask us to assess the physical uh, campus, I'm very familiar with Conlon Life. I actually used to work in that PSA many, many years ago. Um, uh, it is a senior center, as you said. Uh, my understanding is that there is uh, partial security, uh, meaning private security, hired by the housing authority that will do um, uh, either one eight-hour shift or two eight-hour shifts. So they'll have that building covered for about 16 hours out of the 24-hour period. Um, while the NYPD does not control how these monies are invested or the time frame um, as to when the security improvements are made, we can and we will reach out to our partners uh, in the housing authority and ask that uh, for this particular building, it be fast track. Um, you know, I was looking uh, at the numbers for common life as you presented your questions. Um, index crime in, in that development, in that one building uh, is flat for the year. Um, it, it's not something that would be on our radar, but um, people overdosing uh, in the staircase, most likely uh, homeless individuals coming in, it's definitely something we don't want uh, for a whole host of reasons. And we will look into that. I believe I covered both of um, uh, your questions. Yep, because so seniors uh, are relegated to, to their own home, to, to their apartments. They're afraid to come out. They're afraid to use the elevator and certainly won't use the stairs when you have folks uh, with drug use, sleeping on the stairs, uh, uh, using drugs. And, and as I said, uh, actually who have actually taken over apartments uh, within uh, the residents um, from from senior residents, and they're using that to to deal drugs out of. And you know, how, how do we address that? Again, uh, if 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 there's a a, a coordination uh, with 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 other agencies, like you said, DHS and and others that that could facilitate that. And then when you do your 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 security assessment, you know what what does that actually say? And if you could. Uh, if you have it, or if you can get back to us on the latest security assessment for Colin Life, we, we, we would definitely appreciate that. And then um, uh, Chair Adams talked about qualifying, disqualifying uh, 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 of applicants for, for the police department uh, uh, around character and other issues. One around character, I recall having this in committee a few years ago when we were addressing issues of uh, low, low level marijuana and, and other offenses. And, and, and that at that time uh, was deemed to be a matter of character, uh, which seemed to be uh, another reason for disproportionately uh, disqualifying candidates of color considering um, the, the, the stop and frisk and, and the disproportionate amount of low level marijuana arrests and summonses that occur in community of color. Um, obviously, we, 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 I represent the 105th precinct, which nine out of 10 years had the highest uh, summons and arrests in, in the city, which would appear to be a disqualifier. And I speak to this as one with that experience, one who was a, 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 uh, a part of the, uh, I believe it was 1983 class action suit around uh, psychological disqualifications of the police department. So we don't take this lightly. Um, and as you said, now that, well, you know, uh, it's subjective, uh, but uh, two years ago when we had the hearing, it was pretty firm that people frowned on marijuana use as opposed to other things that may uh, use as uh, drug use or other behaviors um, uh, of character that occurred outside of communities of color. Uh, so, what is it now? Does does marijuana use uh, is that considered to be a uh, character disqualifier currently? And, no, and, and if not, what do the numbers say? What do the actual numbers say in terms of disqualification? Do you keep those? So I'll, I'll answer your first question. Absolutely not. Marijuana usage is not um, a disqualifier. It hasn't been even uh, before marijuana became legal in New York state. So we do not disqualify people for marijuana use. Um, and your second question, do we keep numbers on what? On those who have been disqualified for, for marijuana use as it relates to character. So I will tell we can, you know, we can go back and pull the records and the testimony. I assure you in public hearing, uh, it, it was testified that, you know, marijuana was, was uh, was deemed to be a character character flaw, and that folks had been not necessarily it was subjective, 
but that they were uh, in the past uh, uh, disqualified because of that. Yes, I, I, would, I would not disagree with that. In the past, people were, candidates, applicants were disqualified for marijuana usage, but that is no longer the case. Um, again, I've been there for three and a half years. It's never been the case in those three and a half years, and, and that was prior to marijuana becoming legal. So um, it's no longer the case. It was the case in the past. And we still do, just as a addition to that, we still do drug tests, um, all of our candidates just prior to hire, um, and marijuana usage by members of this department is still strictly prohibited. I, I would hope, I would think so. So, uh, and then finally, uh, the question uh, that was also asked by, by, by the chair in, in a number of different ways about uh, folks uh, as relates to uh, uh, members Moyer's legislation um, and, and folks being hired from other uh, departments outside and within the region who had been fired. Uh, those who, does that also apply to those who had resigned from other departments? Do we uh, look and take a deeper dive into why folks are, uh, are resigning from other departments and not assume that this is just a high rate of pay or something? And, and, uh, and, and so that people who may have resigned in lieu of termination are not picked up by the NYPD? Yes, absolutely. So we do a, we, we conduct a personal contact with a supervisor from any law enforcement agency where one of our candidates may have been before. Just a supervisor, no HR, you don't go into to, to, to the record. Uh, you, you, so uh, a supervisor for a smaller municipality or someone obviously who has a relationship is is the one responsible for uh do you ask specific you know what 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 questions are being asked and or do you go into the full uh uh employment file uh so to see? We, we we never get their full employment file we send a written request for all of their um history with their whatever department it is including disciplinary history then we follow it up with a personal phone call from the investigator to a supervisor um, who can give us um, information on why they left the department, if they left that department in good standing, and any further information we can get from them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Adams. Thank you, Councilman Miller. Council, are there any other questions from colleagues? Uh, seeing no other hands raised, I think we're ready to move on to the public panel testimonies. Okay, with that, I say uh, thank you very much, Chief Winsky, Inspector Goddesman, and Director Clark. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, everyone. We will now turn on to the stage of public testimony. Um, first, we'll hear testimony from Andrew Case, followed by Ben Weinberg. Um, please uh, remember to send your testimony into testimony at nyc.gov. Uh, Andrew, you may begin when you're ready. Starting time. We'll unmute you in just a second. Sorry about that, sir. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. you. Um, dear Chair Adams and members of the committee, uh, on behalf of Latino Justice Pearl Def, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Latino Justice supports passage of 2440, which would authorize the CCRB to initiate its own complaints and 2297, which would bar a person from taking a civil service exam for a position in the NYPD if that person has previously been dismissed from a police force for misconduct or resigned from a police force during an open investigation. We are opposed to 1883. Broken locks and burnt out lights can be investigated and repaired by NYCHA. As you heard from the NYPD, performing these investigations would require an increase to police funding and staffing. Latino Justice believes any new funding for security should go directly to NYCHA. Latino Justice believes in an effective and transparent disciplinary system for officers who engage in misconduct, and that includes a robust civilian complaint review board. I personally have a long history with the CCRB, starting as an investigator there in 1997, leaving as Director of Communications and Intergovernmental Affairs in 2008. When the CCRB was established in its current form in 1993, 
the requirement that it receive a sworn complaint to conduct an investigation made sense. Video recording of police civilian encounters was virtually unknown, and the agency is prohibited from making a finding based solely on an unsworn complaint. Without a sworn complaint, the agency would be unlikely, would have been unlikely to collect evidence sufficient to make a finding. But the bar on self-initiated complaints is an impediment to transparency in the age of video footage and social media. If a recording suggesting police misconduct is publicly released in the media or on social media, the agency's inability to investigate makes it look like it's hiding something. Even in 2008, I struggled to explain to a skeptical public when I would give presentations on behalf of the CCRB as to why the agency was not investigating acts of police violence that were reported in the press. We expect that board members will use the power to initiate complaints judiciously, and the vast majority of cases will continue to be initiated by civilian complaints. But because the agency's credibility depends on a perception that it thoroughly investigates misconduct, the law will provide a small but necessary fix in the agency's operations. Uh, number 2297 will close a loophole that allows harmful officers to escape disciplinary consequences by hopping from one police department to the next. It is positive and encouraging to hear from the NYPD that its policy currently prohibits individuals who have been fired or face discipline from other departments uh, from joining the NYPD, but the structure of 2297 will vest this power with DCAS and bar such applicants from even taking the exam. Policy can change over time and having 2297 in place will keep the NYPD from changing that policy in the future. In short, 2240, 2440 will give the CCRB the power to bolster its legitimacy by initiating cases, and 2297 will ensure that officers who try to evade the consequences of their misconduct cannot join the NYPD. Latino Justice supports both bills. Thank you both. Thank you for your testimony, Andrew. We will now move on to Ben Weinberg, followed by, yes, there you are, Ben. Uh, you, will, you will be going next, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu. Uh, ben, you may begin when you're ready. Starting time. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Adams and members of the Public Safety Committee. My name is Ben Weinberg and I am the Director of Public Policy at Citizens Union. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak before you today. Uh, Citizens Union is a century old nonpartisan good government group committed to reforming city and state government by fostering accountability, transparency and ethical standards. We have been studying police accountability and performance for more than a decade, seeking to strengthen public oversight and reduce misconduct at the NYPD. Uh, Citizens Union wishes to state its support for two of the bills under consideration today, intro 2440 by Council Member Adams and intro 2297 by Council Member Moya. First on 2240, Citizens Union believes allowing the CCRB to initiate investigation based on evidence without having to wait for a complaint would strengthen the agency's ability to maintain civic oversight and rein in abuse of force at the NYPD, where citizens are unable or unwilling to file a complaint on their own when there is a clear evidence, such as videos, where uh, possible cases of misconduct are reported in the press, the CCRB, which has developed expertise on this issue should be able to investigate. This would allow for faster responses for possible cases of misconduct. It would also mean more efficient and precise initiation of investigation, considering that most of the filings or complaints the CCRB receives in a year do not really fall within its jurisdiction. Altogether, Citizens Union believes intro 20. 440 would allow the CCRB to take a more active role in fighting police misconduct and would contribute to accountability in our city. Intro 2297 is another bill before the committee today. Citizens Union believes barring people who served in another police force but were dismissed due to misconduct or resigned while being investigated for misconduct, um, barring them from service uh, serving in the NYPD is a sensible and appropriate addition to city law. As mentioned in NYPD's testimony today, this requirement is already enforced in practice. Uh, city law also already bans NYPD officers who were dismissed for any reasons by the NYPD from being reappointed. 
uh, it makes little sense to maintain the legal option for office officers who have been decertified from other police departments to still be employed by the NYPD. This loophole undermines the goal of existing law, could potentially allow for misconduct to propagate across law enforcement and harms the public trust. We know that this proposed provision will only be effective if proper procedures are established to ensure that DCAS and the NYPD are able to identify such relevant candidates. And we also acknowledge this issue is ultimately requires an action by the state legislator or state government and citizens unions support such. I'm expired. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today and have a great day. Thank you, Ben. Have a good day. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Tawaki Kamatsu. If any other individuals would like to speak, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, Tawaki, you may begin. Go ahead, sir. Um, Starting hi. time. Hi. Um, so question, first question I have for you basically is this. Um, the mayor's NYPD security detail has been in the news lately, and there's been no announcement about a public hearing about the mayor's NYPD security detail, specifically Howard Redmond. Um, question, why is that? Meaning, if taxpayers are paying for their op their operations and they're ripping off taxpayers, why are you, Ms. Adams, as a chairwoman of this committee, not making arrangements to have public hearings held? Um, the other issue really is this. This hearing is about the CCRB to a large extent. The CCRB itself is totally useless. Um, Mr. Darsh, he's a defendant in a federal lawsuit for retaliating against his own staff. Um, Judith Lay used to be an investigator for the CCRB. She's currently an attorney for the mayor after I met with her and made uh, complaints against Mr. Redmond, the head of the mayor's security detail, um, also the CCRB, they don't harvest evidence, meaning I made a complaint to the CCRB on April 27th of 2017 by phone. They had sufficient notice that it was their duty to gather the evidence, the video recordings from video security cameras at a school in Queens. They didn't do that. So basically they dropped the ball. Um, the other thing too, um, I beat a, police officer in court, I'm now suing them. Um, again, that involved Ms. Lay. She basically upheld uh, the actions of that police officer in spite of the fact the police officer fraudulently claimed I was trespassing when the New York City's uh, Zola website about zoning matters confirms that my feet actually were not in a park. They were in a public corridor. So the point is when the CCRB conducts investigations, if they conduct sh shoddy investigations, why in the hell is there no oversight of the CCRB such that it actually conducts proper investigations. The same person who illegally stopped me on December 26 of 2017, um, he actually continued to commit uh, illegal acts against other New Yorkers after that. So the question is, why is this person still a police officer if he's continuing to violate the rights of people I've never met, never will meet? I mean, again, you're the chairwoman of this committee. You have, I guess, some oversight powers. So why is Sequoia Harris um, of the NYPD's 48th precinct still a member of the NYPD? Seriously, so same thing with Rafael Beto. Um, he violated my rights on April 27, 2017, and that was after somebody else uh, sued him, Howard Redman. He settled in court with somebody named uh, Summer Porter from uh, what September 20, September 2012 incident. So just Google his name, Howard Redman, R E D M O N D. Seriously, I've got the transcript confirming that he committed perjury on May 19, 2017. The law department also gave me a video recording con confirming that he committed that perjury. So yeah, at the end of the day, this hearing, it's about the CCRB, I guess, granting them greater authority to investigate matters when the fact of the matter is they routinely cover up for the NYPD. I mean, the mayor appoints people like Mr. Darsh, so there's no you know, autonomy. So last point- Time expired. Can I continue just to finish up? Um, I have federal litigation against the city of New York, primarily against the NYPD. Case numbers, 20 CV 7046, that's a consolidated case. Um, there's another one, it's 20 CV 10942. All of you have the legal authorization to submit applications to intervene in that case as interested parties. I think Ms. Adams, you've done that previously in other litigation. So in the event uh, that you wanna do so, I would love to have you. Last point, there's a public hearing in one of those court cases on December 7th with Magistrate Judge Lehrberger against a person who illegally stopped me on December 26, 2017, about which I testified to Vanessa Gill uh, Williams and Corey Johnson on, I think, um, multiple days to the city council. So if you want to attend that hearing, it's at 500 Pearl Street, again, December 7th, uh, 2021, with Magistrate Judge Lehrberger. That's for case number 
20CV10942. That's the end of my testimony. Thank you, Tawaki. We appreciate your testimony. Um, seeing no other members of the public uh, to testify, please, uh, Chair Adams, you may um, close out the hearing. Thank you. Okay, thank you again to all of my colleagues, members of the public, committee council, Josh Kingsley, Matt Thompson, and Ebony, Ebony Meeks, Laidley from the speaker's office, all of our security uh, uh, geniuses that take care of us behind the scenes. We appreciate you all as well. Thank you for taking good care of us all day today, uh, specifically in my hearing today. This meeting is hereby adjourned with a very happy Thanksgiving.